Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Amal couldn't be here today, so I'm stepping in for her. Uh, so you get to hear me for the introduction and the response. Um, so I'm going to read her introduction, though. So uh, bear with me if it's a little bit stilted. Um, so uh, welcome, everyone. It's a great pleasure uh, to welcome Architectin de Wilder Vink Tayu, aka ADVVT, uh, this evening, an inspiring architectural practice led by Jan de Wilder, who is here with us, Inga Vink, and Joe Tayu, uh, who are not here, um, and committed to, op which is an inspiring practice, committed to opening up new possibilities for what architecture can be today. In more than one way, ADVVT embodies a very strong and influential strand of architecture which they were certainly instrumental in putting forth onto the world scene a number of years ago. Specifically, uh, many of us encountered their work, not me, unfortunately, and its power in person for the first time at the Venice Bien Architecture Biennale in 2014, where they were part of the Belgian Pavilion. There, another worldly invitation to rediscover Kuhlhaas's elements of architecture was presented through a combination of careful austerity undone by sensuous materiality, minimal interventions undone by its playful absurdity, and, a no and novel insertions undone by the feeling of found objects, a kind of dreamy and poetic deja vu. While some have engaged an expansion of architectural, architecture and architectural practice that is, outwardly directed, sorry, that is outwardly directed at bringing architectural thinking and design to other fields and practices, ADVVT proposes an expansion of architecture and architectural practice that reimagines every single architectural part every architectural gesture or opportunity, whether a single drawing, an exhibition of drawings, a stand, a bus stop, a set of interventions into an existing building or a new building, every scale, every program, every type, every material, technique, and every assembly, whether drawn or built, is approached with the same level of complete dedication to almost transcend its current state to become a new and unexpected encounter. Reflecting on the work of the practice, Kirsten Gears once commented on this flattening as the context itself becoming the project. This is a context that is understood beyond place, a situation that can, that can encompass time, program, history, art, and culture. Context precedes concept. But this is no heady practice, rather it is both heady and completely committed to making, and the power of making to reinvent what architecture can be and what it can do. Through careful construction, in which the many layers are revealed through rich materiality, abstraction through color, or on the contrary, deep white aging texture, ADVT's projects are exquisitely sophisticated presenting the making of architecture as the ultimate responsibility of the architect, to render through making drawings and buildings to be, sorry, to render through making drawings and buildings to become equally and at times reversibly architecture. ADVVT exhibited work at the Venice Architecture Biennale in 2010 and 2012, as well as 2014, and represented Belgium again in 2016. ADVVT was part of both the 2015 and 2017 editions of the Chicago Architecture Biennial, uh, in addition to their building practice, the firm's drawing practice was featured in two GTA exhibitions at the uh, ATH Zurich Theater Objects, a stage for architecture and art in 2014, and again in 2015 for their own show called Carousel. The work of ADVVT appears in many publications as in A plus U, Poetry of Modesty. Four monographs were published to date in 2011 by Murr, uh, by Murr Paper Kunstall, uh, De Single, uh, Book three, sorry, the numbering I find, <laughs> okay, uh, and by 2G and uh, Adibus International. Uh, maybe Jan can explain the numbering of their monographs. Uh, ADVVT was nominated for the Mies van der Rohe uh, Award in 2013 and 2015 and has won several Belgian architecture awards. Uh, Jan, de, Jan de Wilder, Inge Vink, and Joe Tayu are very active in architectural education. The trio teaches at uh, St. Lucas in, in Ghent and Brussels. Uh, KU Levin's Department of Architecture, oh, sorry, that's parenthetical, never mind, and at, the, at EPFL Enoch in Lausanne, and has been visiting professor at TU Delft, EPFL, and the Mendrizo Academy of Architecture, uh, Universita, Universita del Svizzera Italiana. So please welcome uh, Jan de Wilder. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Some reading. Okay, uh, you s changed already this slide, but uh, though I had to say the previous slide, um, I was somehow very happy that my name was wrongly spelled, and I asked to keep it, but you changed it. Maybe sometimes you should not do such things, because I think this wrong spelling of my name is, was the best introduction to our work. 
I will talk about this and about that and such and so on because everyone always wants to have a title. And um, now I will start quickly with introducing you, I believe it's like 15 slides or 13 slides, each slide one project, but to quickly drone you in some ideas. This is not the final concept of our work, but like 13 ideas that we have to admit that are always around. Then later I will take you much more profoundly into like seven projects and then we fade away with observations and we'll see how many times left. Sometimes we don't reach the end of the slideshow but we don't mind. This is a facade of a building we built twice for production studios for a dance company and a theater company. And why I like to show the facade, because the facade shows how things are, how they are built, how space is continuously evolving throughout, which spaces need some more intimacy and have a wall with a window and other just are windows. And if you have a close look, then you see that none of the construction elements have the same dimension. They change from position and they change from dimension as in fact the load-bearing structure needs only those dimensions at a certain point. And they change from materialization. As we asked to the engineer when he came on the table the first time and we had asked him to design a construction scheme, he came with concrete beams and concrete columns of the same size and we asked him to do his work again and to propose as a scheme in different materi materials, but also for each point of the scheme, the exact dimension and not a kind of overall dimension. And then for us, it was easy. We just had to shift the plans of the engineer above each other and make choices. And that's what we adore a little bit, showing it, but being lazy at the same time. It's the engineer who made the concept of the facade. Second project, this is an interior of a veterinary clinic in which the doctors who commissioned us the job asked to spend as less as possible money on the building so they could spend as much as possible on the equipment of the surgery rooms, the MRR scans and whatever is all available in nowadays modern veterinary clinics. The only thing we changed in that idea is that we changed for every wall a kind of other type of rough building block. One time concrete, one time more ceramic, different sizes, and then walls need to be connected with each other. And in the sand on the building site, we repeated with the contractor how we could do it, how we could nail one wall in the other wall. And finally, we discovered ourselves how we had did, how we did it a kind of contractor's mentality ornament. And on the right side, you see the white painted wall. Some walls we painted white, and the painter told us that he stopped painting the whole wall because he understood the ornament from the other side. We didn't ask him to do like this, but he acted like this. This is what we mean making of things. A third picture is an interior picture of a single family house, of which on one hand I could tell you a story about the sustainability of this construction. In an old building we didn't want to insulate on the outside. We placed a glazed building on the inside with an average width towards the outside of one and a half meter, and I don't have to tell what the effect is of one and a half meter air insulation and how that works and that in winter you have to heat up less more than in summer and so on. But no, I like to tell you or I like to point you merely to the fact how light now comes from above and how you can see in the concrete ring that goes around. This concrete ring was a position of the previous floor. We took it away and light enters the house. And if you see the central fireplace, what I like especially, or what I was looking at especially, is how 
it was positioned towards the former fireplace. Sustainable living, not as a question of scientific ideas, but as a question of a way of life. Fourth project, one slide. It's a building, it's a building, it's an, a taller building, renovation of a building which was in a bad condition. And in that building, we invented a scheme of new columns. And if you have a closer look also here, you will see that those columns have different sizes depending on the load they had to carry. And then on a certain moment, we had a concrete wall, which is in fact a beam as it uh, surpasses a space below this level, an entrance. And as concrete was, it's not because we are in Switzerland, because we are in Belgium, but this concrete was not of the best quality. And especially this here, this kind of typical given thing that you have this milk cement, like we call it in between cast work and concrete made, that you had this kind of wrong things in the concrete. And the building client, the city of Ghent, didn't want to pay this to the contractor, demanded a new, con a new wall, and the contractor didn't want to change it. And then you know what happens on building sites, you got a fight and you lose time and by that a lot of money. And here was yet also another mistake. Though the plans were clear how the pipe for the fire should run, it was totally mis-executed. And then we made a link. We painted this kind of dirtiness red by which it became a new language on its own. And it connected two things that have nothing to do with each other, with each other. And then we went on search for other mistakes. And instead of losing time and instead of losing money and getting into troubles, we redefined for the whole building process a kind of correction mode in how to get along with what went wrong like spelling my name wrong. Another one is the occasion of context. It's an old abbey. You see the large corridor. We found out that the wall between corridor and rooms was not an original wall and by that we were allowed by the monumental services to replace the wall. And the client wanted to have an open office structure. I would say then don't buy an abbey. <laughs> but they wanted to have all walls away, so it was impossible. But as we found out that this wall was not real wall, we could replace it by a system of sliding doors. And sometimes you can put it open and you can close it. And the old doors in between come in a strange way back. But the point I show you this is that the color scheme is the result of the research of the original colors of the rooms. And each color, each room had another color. And that helped us out in reconnecting steel constructions and glazed facades and whatever change we did. But each time along the room, we were facing the other color. Context as a simple treasure. The backside of a house, a kind of small city palace, we call it in Ghent, a former single family house, which became now a shop. And the client bought it because they wanted to have the shop all levels. As you can see, the light is on. But the shop for fire regulations needed an extra staircase as the old wooden staircases were not, could not be taken in account. And we, have, we had it to add something where we didn't want to add something. But we added the staircase, sorry. We added the staircase, but then we just folded out the perspective of the facade to give the idea that we didn't add anything at all. Maybe it goes together with this slide. This is not a Philippe Dujardin collage. It is a reality. And it's a corner point of a square farmstead, a taller house, one could say. 
and how spatially wise the old barn is reconnected. And I will not explain this project as such, but I just wanted to show this slide because I believe it's not too, not too bad in the idea that at the end, a certain confusion, one could say, is part of what we are looking for. This confusion, not as a statement or a politic, but as an idea that architecture rather would be deliver you an everyday way, not to survive, but a way to discover things. I think one of the other vast ingredients in which we are very interested is the idea of the interior. Maybe this is also the interior of the exterior amongst building parts. But this is really the interior. We are back in that shop where we reconnected floors, not only by staircases, but by just leaving away floors, re-establishing new experience into the interior. Interior not by particularly adding, but by taking things away. I come to this project, which is a very small one, which is in fact a small barn into a taller garden in which there is a small farm. I don't show it. We did it many years ago. And then after five years, the client had four daughters. The daughters were expelled into the garden in their own house, this small little barn. And what you see is a small gap because we are not allowed. We could get no building permit for it. But still, we made a small gap to have light inside. And the left side of the gap is a mirror, and the right side is the real uh, window. Just enough to get into that intimacy of the bar, just enough to get southern light in it that turns throughout the day and reflects itself in the mirror. The interior of the exterior coming into the house. And this is the last of this small range of projects that I do not explain totally, but once again, fundamentally, I think all the other projects have been shown up until now. They start maybe from in the interior. And this is a typical Flemish situation. What you see is a kind of cascade of um, rooms that had been added to the main building. You see just a glimpse of the main building over there. And that turned out to be a following system, about 25 meters of rooms, by which the house got connected with a garden. And we reconnected in this sense that half of this length we changed back into garden rooms. And all the other things, I can tell you, is just the pleasure of form. Ah, there is one more in this range. Maybe two more. Yes. A house in Antwerp. We are not responsible for the brickwork. That's a house from the 60s. And the biggest mistake of that house was, as you can see on the left and the right side, the beautiful facades from the 19th century. A nice occasion that this is on the uh, crossing of two streets that come together. But the previous client, or it was not our client, the previous owner built himself a house only for himself till the height he could afford and in an architecture that did not took in account anything from the surrounding. We could not change that too much, but if our client came up to us saying, we bought this, we proposed to make half a house, but use the verticality to restore the lines of the street, and on the other hand, to avoid that we had to refurbish this part of the house, by which we could introduce a small patio garden. And then the last one, coming back from the beginning. This is, to me, one of the most important pictures or images we have in our practice. This is Ghent, the city we are from. On the right side, you see the back side of buildings which has been raised in 1900, when Ghent had the advantage of the textile revolutionary industry the um, investors in this industry has been, have been changing the city fundamentally as they 
organized a building campaign of small houses for all the new laborers they needed for their industry. And they are very sim sympathetic and very symptomatic at the same time for the city of Ghent because they are four meters width. At that time, they were revolutionary in the quality. Today, they are, of course, to be remade, rebuilt, whatever. It's what every young couple wants to have in Ghent. But on the other hand, the city of Ghent sometimes demolished them and replaces then like six of them with four new houses, which I think is a problematic topic when you think about sustainable small living. Anyway, we have a made a house with an energy level which is called low level, and this is a passive house next to us, which is twice as big from volume. I think there is an opposite in interest. But anyway, I look to this. This is our small contribution to the idea of city living, and I'm very glad we are the smallest. And last idea, that's now 15 slides, I guess. This is, here we have done a refurbishment of the house I will not talk about. But I just talk about this simple facade, which is totally closed as a kind of blind wall, and it was covered with cement tiles. Those cement tiles were asbestos made, need to be retaken, and the wall needed to be restored. But the cement tiles had this oblique lining, and finally we decided to draw back the texture of those slides on the wall. Also, this is part of our pleasure. Okay, second part of the lecture. Some real work. This is a kind of painting we made, but it's of course a collage. And it's a drawing we made as an entry of a competition. Take it in your mind. What you see here is the building we're going to talk about any minute. But you also should take in your mind those kind of white arcades which are around in this park. It's about this. It's the psychiatric clinic in Malle, near to Ghent. It is a project that has been started also around 1900. Until 1900, in fact, psychiatric diseases, the idea on that was more about locking up people. And they were locked up in the city, and the sanitary conditions or hygienic conditions were, of course, you could not imagine. And then, around 1900, they invented around the city, in a park, a totally new master plan of separate buildings designated to separate, separate, uh, several dis different diseases, but also to the difference we, between rich and poor people. But anyway, it delivered a nice concept of an open park, which is daily and night open and everyone could enjoy. And it had a beautiful amount of architectural, a little bit Belle Epoque styled villas, like we call them. As revolutionary it was at that time, later on, especially after World War, they started to replace buildings one by one. And if we had like 14 or even more, it depends on how you count of those villas in the beginning, you see here a plan of the situation today. So many of the villas have been replaced and you can recognize as typically plans of hospital buildings. And soon, the quality of these beautiful plans, this kind of symmetrical plans, simple plans, disappeared. It is now like four years ago, this is a situation on model, it is like four years ago that a young director, a man of my age, very young, arrived at the moment that there was a new building campaign in demolishing buildings. There was one here, and this is our, I will talk about soon. And when he arrived, the one was totally demolished, and the one we will envision now, they only took away tiles, and one bulldozer drove in it, but they had to stop because of asbestos problematics. And this director said like, okay, that's true, those buildings, 
cannot be used anymore according nowadays regulations and sub consequently subsidies one get in Europe to organize your hospital. So the architects until then said, yeah, well, you know, then you have to demolish them and you have to replace them. And if you can't use them anymore, just demolish them because you get subsidies for it. So perverse the system was. But the, the director said, let's stop doing it and let's start the other way around. What could we do eventually with buildings like such, buildings we cannot use anymore in a proper way? And he launched a competition, invited three architectural offices to think about that building, and his question was very open. If we as architects were convinced that you could do nothing with it, we could advise to demolish it further on. We proposed two things. We, were quest or we answered the question on one hand, but also we proposed something else in the competition. First thing we proposed, although it was not demanded, and that's what I ask you to recall in your memory, is that we said as we start to lose the identity or the, 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 the unity of the whole campus, we propose to look to the campus in a different way. So good to see is this is the building how we found it. So the original building and the addition from the 50s or 40s maybe, which is a kind of concrete closed box. So we went through it and we made a catalog of all the buildings and the additional constructions or the original constructions which were there. And our simple proposal was to say, Let's go back to find unity and let's redefine some of those objects to become unity by clearing them really out as white arcades, loggias, places where people can hide when the sun is too hot. We should say today since the new climate change or when there was too much rain as it was five years ago in Belgium. This was the first thing and we expressed in that sense that our proposal was a proposal not only for a building in this stage, but a proposal for further on evolution. You see it back now here on this slide. The main thing then, the building. This is a model we made, and why we made the pro model had two things in mind. First, to show what we want to do, but second, we also said that our idea is that such a question on think with us about a building and what it could mean for us was a question of process. So we could start with a design for it, but before we wanted to build, we wanted to have a debate with everyone, doctors, the therapists, uh, collaborators, who else? Patients. And that's why we make this puppet scaled model that we could open and by which we could debate with everyone ideas on how we could progress. So we set our process, our proposal. We don't want to see it as a delivery of a design, but we want to see it as a future debate. And that's why we made this model. And the making of this model went together with the making of sketches. Not only sketches for the competition, but later on, in the debate with the client sketches in a way that you almost on site could make them along the, along the um, talk you had. But then the proposal, maybe last but not least. This is what you see today. And I guess you can agree on the fact that this is quite accordingly the way we found it on one hand, but on the other hand also accordingly the idea of, for example, the white arcades that should walk around the whole park. Yes, the tiles were gone and the tiles are still gone. Yes, the bulldozer drove in here to the building and we prepared the building because the construction is, of course, also our concern. Yes, the building is now totally open and we opened all the upstands of the windows and we made a kind of enlarged plan of the 
um, basement, not the basement of the RHOC, the ground floor. So that, in fact, the building became part of the park or vice versa, the park enters the building. I'm just going to walk with you now to, through some slides. When you come closer, you discover some greenhouses. Those greenhouses entered more fundamentally the project after competition, saying on one hand, like, yes, we want to have a building which is totally open, but on the other hand, we want to have some spaces which could be, give us a little bit more protection, but we don't want to have a technical building, no heating, no ventilation. So it's a building that you will have to use throughout the seasons in a totally different way. No technology upgrade. The only thing which is around today is a Wi-Fi router, seemingly that's now even as important than the foundations of a building. And then ideas came like, yes, we have some greenhouses and we will be able to demount them and to replace them. And that's what actually we're going to do soon with this one. We're going to kick it out, install a small cafe in it, and we move on with the project. Yes, we will soon change floors or repair floors, I will tell you about later. And this is the building as it is. And what happens? There happens a lot of things. But always those kind of things that partly they tried and partly came totally unforeseen. Psychiatry is quite a tough world and also this uh, hospital has a lot of youngsters and kids amongst them. And the youngsters, they come in the evening and they gather here together. There is a street lamp, lamp, fairly light enough. On the other hand, the board meetings happen now over there. In the winter with a jacket, in the summer in the sun. And when it rains in the greenhouse and the director tells me it works far more better to come to conclusion in those boards. Here we took away the floor between basement and between ground level. And we made a kind of small arena. There is also a nursery school connected. And from spring on, especially with the better climate conditions, teaching happens over there. We installed a small fireplace. That is the favorite place of the youngsters when they come at evening and smoke their G together. A tree entered the room, and when it rains, the rain can drown away in the ground. And then, maybe some attention to ways we help to survive the building. When there were huge gaps due to old electricity passages or whatever, we give, a rule, we give the rule to the contractor, saying every of those gaps you should like a little bit uh, um, stitch it together. Or when a window sill, a wooden window sill was taken away, we just cover it with some concrete, simply cast it. And then another day when we arrived and the Belgian sky was blue with white clouds, we decided to paint them white and the daughter of the contractor came in, in school holidays to paint them all white. And at the end, we have now a building which is part of a debate. Yes, sometimes a therapy does not take more than five minutes being with your patient over there. Yes, we understood that for some psychosis, the understanding of space is fundamental and this one-to-one -one model now helps them sum out throughout this. Yes, there are still non-believers around and there are people, patients who walk with a huge bow around it as they are scared. But yes, there are also a lot of kids playing around and a lot of people or doctors really actively interfering into the house, into the building. Next project. I think this project of the Caritas Psychiatry, maybe I'm personally not really ready with it. But that's also 
what was our entry proposal. Let's move on with it. And yes, we're going to make changes. Even the director claimed in the jury statement that this building was maybe even ready for a future real use. Maybe in 15 years, they could reorganize it as a new administrative building. And that's what I believe is part of the chance of this kind of situation, that this kind of statements really could work. At the end, I have to say, we saved the building for only 100,000 euros more than the demolishing. It's quite a difference. The other building which was demolished delivered a new grass field of no use. Second project, the city of Charleroi. We are now in the French side of Belgium, as far as you might be interested in our local constraints. This is Charleroi, a city of heavy metal industry, not mining, but heavy metal industry. And this is a photograph from the moment the building I like to talk about was in a building site. The building is tall, 6,000 square meters, which is quite something. And it is, in fact, two buildings of each three levels high, and each level is average seven to eight meter. And in the beginning, in the middle, there is a huge lobby hall, 12,000 square meters big. It was a time in the 60s that it could have not been big enough, but one has to understand the photo is taken from the Bell 4, the city tower, looking towards the lower land around, the lower city around. And those small mountains are residues of the metal industry. And the meaning of the building was that in the 60s, Belgium was very known for their mining and for the metal industry, that it become a Palais des Expo, in which they could show off their products, their end products in metal. And they were, they were a very stressful building, this. And you can see this is unfinished. It will be finished later on. But this photo was our entry into the competition. Charleroi has no industry anymore today. Charleroi, unluckily today, has an enormous economical problem. By that, they got subsidies from the European community to restore the building. They got 30 million euros, but one has to be honest, to really renovate it completely for such a tall building, you need almost 100,000 euros, 100 million euros. The brief of the competition told that you got 30 million euros to give this an architectural upgrade in the sense of its appearance, but also in the sense of its sustainable character. And the brief admitted that there was no money to restore the other spaces. I have to tell you, the strange thing of the building is, when it was delivered in the 60s, the economy went bankrupt and they never used the building as whole. But the building is there and disconnect upper and lower city. The entrance was this photo. We had some other materials to explain you. Here the building was not yet there. There's the Bell 4, the lower city, railway tracks, and the huge difference of height. Our proposal was to not upgrade the middle part, but to take away facades and to enjoy the beautiful concrete structure in all its heights and extents and the staircases that goes along with it as a new open urban park. We added a few things like a much comfortable uh, elevators and escalators, but this was the proposal. Let's not do too much than just unreveal, accordingly this photograph, the building into a new urban structure that could connect upper and lower city much better and by that save money to do a basic fundamental technical upgrade of the other parts of the building. And though, although it was so opposite to what the brief claimed, we won it and we started now two weeks ago the building side of it. But we are proud of it in the sense that the scale exercise delivers us the opportunity to experience in real time. But on the other hand, also, again, for us, it is about, I would say, a fundamental change in how to get along with the things, the context, as we have them or find them. 
third project. Just to make sure that you don't start to believe that we only can accelerate in this kind of conditions as I showed off now. You see in the other 15 projects. But now I like to return to a recent delivered building which is about elderly housing and which is about elderly housings from different stages. Really the room of full equipment and full service and also rooms which we call service apartments which are in fact normal apartments but with a service en plus. A kind of buildings you can grow through if I can say it in an optimistic way. I like very much, and all the photos you've seen are from the hand of uh, Philippe Dujardin, except at the end there are a few others of ourselves, but you will, will understand totally the quality. But this is Flanders, maybe just to introduce you. This is a small village, uh, generally around two, two story high buildings. Uh, this context, you can say it's uh, ugly, it's of no mean. I would say it's true, but it's the culture of Flanders. And that this building is still there is because just the neighbor didn't want to sell his plot. Anyway, this is the entrance. And this is the plan. It's quite a huge building. It has a lot of rooms and a lot of apartments. And normally those buildings appear as being big blocks. But we try to rescale it towards the scale of its surrounding. And the idea was to have a central axis on which different wings, what we call groups in which people live together, were transversal uh, orientated to. And this is the plan. The X you can recognize, the central corridors of the different wings also, and maybe the plan difference is only this. Normally rooms of such a buildings have a window that looks straight forward. We just, in plan, shifted each room a little to arrive at this, to find a way that we could add in rooms windows that go around the corner. We studied it here on models, another model of another situation, and this is what we told to our client, you know, they, want, they always want to be different than the others. And we said, well, maybe just the difference is the way we connect rooms to each other or we disconnect apartments the one from the other. And this is the result. You are not anymore in a room looking to the outside straight forward, but you are looking in a room that looks along the building. And from this way out, you have an oblique perspective, which is totally different. The building walks a little bit away. More openness is found. And I could not say much more than saying, well, this is what we were looking for. This corner, this window, the way the roof comes over, and the way you look away back to the village around. In the corridor, this delivers this plan. Also, the corridor is not this long, long way till the end. But it's a way in which it diverses, in whatever way you look at. And it doesn't make that building more expensive. It's just a small difference in economy, but such a difference in the way of living together. And the building is low. The above apartments have a pitched ceiling because of the pitched roof. And some of the below apartments, as there is a small gradin, small change of land along, they are just a little bit sunk into the area. And then comes along small details. You might not see it directly, but you see all the beams coming out with small mirrors at the end and small mirrors in between that do reflect the surrounding and sometimes with some roof, light, with some daylight, it's like the roof is a little bit floating over. And here you can see everything is a little bit sunk in the area. This is from a window in the interior on which the area just enters at the same level of the window sill. 
to me, this picture is as much as saying the same thing as in the psychiatric clinic or in the strategic thing of Charleroi, is trying to look for where the small difference can deliver the difference in the way we can experience life. And here, it's in a building which is according building codes and sustainable expectations, but still. Fifth project, a pavilion. A pavilion which has been demolished in the meantime, and one could say maybe that's exactly the definition of a pavilion. This pavilion, we built it one year ago, and it was on the occasion of a festival. I don't know anymore if I have pictures of the other thing. We did two things. It was a temporary construction, and this <coughs> construction was, was meant to stay, but since the client, the government, of forests and landscape made a, a mistake in their own building permit, they had to demolish it. Anyway, but where it's about, I mean, pavilions always are about experience, ex experiments, experimenting things. And I don't know what went in our head, but the idea was that we used the old planks of the old pavilion to cast the concrete and then quickly it went a kind of exercise in way of constructing. And what you see here is tappling of concrete, of uh, blocks, of um, bricks, not in a way you usually do, there is no mortar in between, but we used the brick as a kind of formwork. We casted the formwork and then we poured concrete in it to experience a new way of building, a way we never did before. It was a pure, I would not say formalistic, but a pure materialistic exercise. And this is the building at the certain stage, and I will talk about this silver stamp soon, because we wanted this building to be in the nature and to be able to pick over the nature as quick as possible. We also talked with, with, with people who know something about leeches and all those caps were interesting for insects and small animals. But then, for example, the concrete, we cast it roughly as also the roof. We throw sand into the cast so that we could obtain this kind of roughness. It was like opposite to what we are looking for, refinement and precision. We wanted to experiment the opposite idea. And this is the outcome. And I'm, again, maybe like within the psychiatric clinic, those exercises today, I'm not ready with it. But I'm really interested, or we are really interested in the way of making things. And not just making them different to be different, but to experiment by doing those exercises how different things could be. And then you can talk about beauty or not. We believe it has something like beauty. And it's a pavilion. It's an exercise in balance. It has many exercises at the same time. And even with the contractor, we calculated that the plates should start to bend throughout time. I just show it because it is part of the way we love to approach things. And now, this is the testing point from the beginning. And now we are at that point that it has been demolished. And now I have to catch up, watch up with what I'm gonna tell. I go back to those silver stamps. Sorry, damned. It's a small side story, you've seen them. This is a hand trail of Miss van der Roos Tugenhut house. And we all know that this house had been damaged throughout its history. The original landlords only lived short time in it and had to leave the house because of the war coming. And later on, the house has been occupied by German, by Russian, and so on. And the house got damaged throughout, and I had a chance, together with Inge, to visit the house one week before restoration. And we took a series of photographs regarding the traces of time. And this is one of the most beautiful. 
It is this silver railing, chrome, chromatized, and then a silver duct tape. So the handrail was damaged, and someone repaired it with a silver duct tape, and to me this was that interesting moment between beauty of richness and beauty of poverty, of scarcity. It led to this. We make pieces of furniture for a gallery in Antwerp. We call it silver tables. And this table is just a black metal tape polished with diamond pieces, well, uh, dust. And it delivers a mirroring This is just opened to the air, which is better than any other mirror. But we don't chrome it. We don't chromatize it. The chrome that locks this beauty, which is the normal process, we don't do it. It's also a very chemical process. And then when you leave it to the open air, or let's say depending on the way you clean it, it starts to oxidate again. And that was in our interest. Though this very precise process, on the other hand, the meaning of life that comes back. And I know people who have it, and still after years, it's still beauty itself. But others used to have a party on it or forget their glasses, and the next morning they discover the traces, some even in a very wild extent. But to us, this table became a small thing in which we had to say, oppose a little bit to the idea of the need of sustainable materials, sustainable actions as such. As you see, my opinion at least, it might be personal, how beautiful also this way of life can be. I was very happy to discover, I was scared, I said to Ing always, I will never want to go back to the house because I'm pretty sure that they cleaned out too, out too much the history of time. We have to understand this house is not only a architectural highlight, unfortunately it is too much, it is also a highlight in European history. You know, the onyx wall, that survived, it's thanks to a German soldier. If we want it or not, but that's a real story. He protected it with a brick wall around it because he knew that the Russians were coming after him and that they were even more cruel than they were. Beauty is that in the restoration, they didn't restore it. They left it with the traces as the traces were found throughout time. And I connect it now back to the silver pole. This whole idea of confusing qualities, of confusing richness, delivered us another gallery in, Ant in Brussels asked us to make objects. Well, this is now, you know, this typically building pole. We can sell it to you and come to your house and install it. It's not a constructural need but it might be an object to change the interior or the way of walking through your space. But on top, since we covered it with a silver tape, it becomes a totally other object. And together with that, you need this kind of security key to put in here. We have different, like with cars, different levels of quality. A gold one, a silver one, and a taped one depending on your money you want to spend. And it goes together with a whole set of columns we deliver if you want to change your house. And here you see them in the Biennale 2016, the Belgian pavilion, not in the pavilion, but in the barn. It was a public secret that there was a second venue over there and those who knew could see it. Small story gifts. The 2016 pavilion, we saved money on our budget we got from the Flemish community. And you have to know the Flemish community in Belgium and the Wallonian community, they don't work together. If you want it or not, I would love it, but they don't. And every year, they have to bring in new material. And this barn was about of collapsing. And this buckets you see, we also taped. Because it's raining inside the Belgian pavilion every year. 
we left it over to the Fermi's community saying it's a gift for Belgium. And we placed them here, a whole collection of things we gift for Belgium. And this was quite a political problem. We even had to explain it on the Belgian radio that it was not a political statement. But we said, no, we want to save things together. It's an obsession observing things. This is Zurich, Urlikon. And this is probably something Swiss people can't stand. It's a parking which has structural problems, and they had to help it a little bit. But it's of an incredible beauty. Uh, you, this is a lesson in construction. You see that, of course, on the below parts, you need more of them than on the above parts, but it becomes a symphony of poles. And although it's an engineer question, at the end, someone painted them all yellow. So there was a concern of perception and of pleasure. It is part of this catalogue of things we do aside, a silver table, there's objects, but they are for me and for us as much the way we like to think and observe and enjoy the things we make. So we declare this now a project of us. We don't know who the author is, but we now sell it as an intervention. So far that lately, recently, some of the poles were part of the ready-made show held in the Swiss Institute here in New York. They are covered together with a Petra Blaise uh, curtain and with some photographs as you've seen as such. Last project before we fade away and some observation things. This is Flanders profoundly. This is a suburb of Ghent, houses of the 50s. Again, this kind of private houses. There is a huge interest in the private housing in Flanders, and it's part of the economical thinking of how to realize housing. And we did a kind of small extension of this house, and maybe our extension is not that different from all the other things. You know, Flemish, they built first their main house, and then they start to make extensions, and actually, the real life happens in these extensions regarding the garden. But there are maybe some differences. As you can see with our neighbor, the connection with the garden is not that big. And here is another window. And when you come close, you start, hopefully, to discover material changes, like a concrete beam became a wooden beam. And a volume seems to also not only cover another room, but deliver, deliver the other room towards the garden. It's a shifted position of volumetries. But merely why I wanted to show you is about the interior. And this connects again with the first range of photographs that I've shown you. You could ask, what is this? Well, I'm glad you asked it. Because that's where it's about. It's a whole series of interventions of different constructions that come together but one morning, we are there, and you try to find the idea. And the other morning, you don't want to find the idea, but you just enjoy the space as you see it. Concrete column, concrete beam, but then a wooden window helping the construction scheme. A wooden beam from the pitch of the roof coming through the space. And then a green column picking up another part a kind of small dance of daily pleasure. I just walk with you now quickly through the house. We walk back to the main house and you discover the door we've seen from the backside and the way how a small parts use now on the long run of the plan delivers lies, life and pleasure into the house. We are now in a main house and we look to the backyard. And the green well, let's keep that for a question. We walk out the house to the front door, and maybe at the end, the intervention of the brickwork was just a kind of unconscious mind intervention after we the first time entered the house and found this kind of decorative brickwork from the beginning. 
We traveled to the five projects and a kind of waving out. I just want to finish maybe with some things like I started with projects. I now like to share some small ideas. Ideas we also use when we have to debate questions like what is architecture for you and this kind of things. This is San Gotardo. It's a mountain in Switzerland and the San Gotardo tunnel must be worldwide known. Everyone takes it every summer on its way to Italy coming from the north. But we always go over the San Gotardo. Since the first time we did it, we never wanted to do it anymore, this tunnel. And this is a bow, and this is an August family picture, nothing special, tourists, cyclists, everyone around, sunny day. But this is exact the same position one year before. And this picture is for us the idea of, let's say, when things that have nothing to do with each other all of a sudden have something to do with each other. Take in mind the last project that I've shown. It's an electricity pile, a traffic sign, small chapel and a staircase, and then this statue with the horse. Things that have nothing to do with each other, but a condition, the wet, gray day, makes that all of a sudden things have something to do with each other. We love that idea. And I think it's not strange after what I've shown you. Second thing is an artwork of a Flemish architect. And I could talk about where it's about, but I will save time. But what he writes on the after artwork is maybe you know some French maître en jeu. In Flemish, it's op het spel zetten. I could translate by saying is daring to risk things. Third thing, this is not a building of us, luckily, but this is really nice. Fourth thing, sorry, um, the Belgian artist raised as an architect though, Francis Alice, who lives in Mexico City, once wrote this, sometimes doing something poetic can become political and sometimes doing something political can become poetic. Another nice observation. Someone replaced the lightning and I don't know why needed to turn it. Or well, someone changed the perspective lines of the joinery of bluestone in a church. A beautiful fence which was damaged clearly. Who did repair this? A child, student in art, someone really annoyed and bored that day, it could be you. Another. A couple of years ago in APFL we had a review, final review, and we wanted to have on site of the review with our guests a small middag lunch with nice cheese and whatever. We didn't found a table around free as it was stuffed with student projects. And then we constructed this. And totally surprised, we found out that even the height of the table was according European regulations. We asked ourselves whether Ray and Charles had foreseen this. A classic one which is in our range of is it references? I don't like the word. It's observations. It's a drawing of Sol Lewitt, you can recognize. It was in a porch entry of a beautiful city palace, a huge tall city house with many rooms. 
and normally horses and coaches went through it, but then in the 90s or late 80s it became an art gallery, that's why this art gallery has a piece of soluet. The gallery went out to somewhere else and the building was sold and a new landlord installed 23, I believe, door uh, studios for students and ordered his electrician to install 23 doorbells and the light switch. And is of course the murder on an art piece or maybe not. Maybe it's incredible that I guess this electrician was not aware about what this drawing was or from who it, w it was because then he would never have done it. At the end, so Lewitt guided the works. The lining of the bells and the tip of the lights which it couldn't have been done better. It intrigues me, it intrigues us on how things again come together and then work in a different way than foreseen. And it brings me this range of observations to a project we showed here in New York at the Friedman Benda Gallery, I think now a small year ago, in which we were invited to be part of a collective presentation. And the topic of the presentation was pieces of furniture for architects, I mean, as a homage to architects. And what we show here is in fact no more nor less an observation from a workshop of a carpenter or let's say a cabinet maker who often store leftover pieces of plates they used against the wall. And we sold it as a day chair, a day bed for Frank Lloyd Wright. Once I was in this house of Frank Lloyd Wright in Chicago and they told me over there at a certain moment when we pointed to one of the lamps of Wright that he once declared his lamps as simply an exercise of stapling books upon each other and shifting them a little bit away. This was our contribution to the show. Some plates shifting away, becoming an impossible day bed for Frank Lloyd Wright like his furniture or like everything of him was always somehow impossible. How nice it also is. But of course, with another precision than just picking up the plates from the workshop, we found out a system of how to connect them and bring them really to a piece. On the other hand, just the pleasure of observation and going so directly towards something. The laziness I talked to you about in the beginning is probably part of our thinking, but it's a nice laziness. Thank you, I will just guide you now quickly to some books if you are still interested, you can look at. It's a series you can only find on second hand mark, market. We, bought, we made ourselves with Mer Paper Kunsthalle, as mentioned. After we made that on the occasion of the 2010 Biennale, uh, we were, when which we were invited by Kazuyo and Rui, this monograph came over us. It has never been printed, but it will be reprinted soon. Now, 2G became part of the Walter Koenig publishing house, with a kind of, with a kind of, let's say make over to the actual status of our work. Swiss Quartverlag gave us the opportunity to make a, um, a monograph and the third one was uh, last year um, available at the ANU monograph series. It sold out also unfortunately and the nice thing about it is that uh, there were three different forms, namely a first form which was wrong and which stated architecten de and then velder vinktailleux. So they reprinted the cover as a sleeve around it and we asked them to reprint the cover twice. So those who were quick have now three different ANUs on our work though they are the same. And as we had this first one book, one, two, three, made ourselves many years ago now, 
the idea came up that we needed to remake them. But we just stole the monographs available at the market and we cut all books at the same size and put them in a box. And then the 2G, which was not yet in Walter Koenig's and the brand, we made a bootleg version of it by photographing the original book and selling it now as a bootleg. This delivers, the thing is, I think the way we made the book was accordingly the way we love to make projects. We stole it and we reformed it into something else. This was a unique series, I believe, of a small 100 copies. And the funny thing is that they could laugh very much with Walter Koenig on this. That's why they now finally, as a kind of counter-reaction, will print a book. <coughs> Not only those books, we make also books like Bravoure Scarcity Beauty, which is a small catalogue we made for our contribution in the Belgian pavilion we curated. But then coming back to our actual today contribution, unless ever people, so as sit in the introduction, I believe the um, Caritas project is on show at the Venice Biennale this year. And for that we made a workbook, different maybe than other architectural books, in which we, on the right hand, we have each time the photo of Philippe Dujardin, but on the left hand, we invited a lot of people to comment our project. And this are not only texts by official architectural historians or philosophers, but also by the director, for example, or also by people who have lived over there, or students who organize all kinds of activities over there. So it became a workbook which goes beyond the architectural celebration and became now also a workbook they use in the psychiatry to debate architecture and psychiatry and next, uh, and next futures. For example, a doctor wrote a text. It's a very small book and it becomes part of this small book series we are setting up right now together with the Bravoure Scarcity book series and it will be available soon also in a box and becomes a new series of commenting projects. And last, we are not uh, unproud, we are very proud to be, be the third monograph in a Spanish series, Archives, Archives, uh, which is once again out of Spain, an unbelievable monograph series, very young now, and we are part of, we are glad to be the third now in it, after Flores and Prats and Bearte de Platzes. And the next, I can't tell you, but is the next beautiful or interesting practice in this series. You can follow us at our Instagram accounts. Universum Carousel Journey is the one of the ETH studio we are running. And maybe just at the end, this, a sleepless night at the kitchen. Back to bed, thank you. Uh, well, thank you for the lecture and, and for, at least I think for most of us, introducing you, us to, to the work. Um, which I, I, for one, wasn't uh, familiar with beforehand, and it's very exciting to see. Um, maybe start, I, I'm not sure this is a, I'm not sure where the question will go, uh, but in looking at things, I would say I and probably many other people often try to find a comparison or a frame of reference or a way, a way of um, contextualizing the work we're seeing relative to others. And I was struck at a certain point, I was looking at your work and thinking, I don't know what this is like. And then it struck me that the thing that this is most like is Frank Gehry's house, which seemed like one of the least likely things for a Belgian architect's work to be like. And so I wonder if that uh, relationship resonates at all 
with your history uh, or your work? I know that that is, of course, today the big thing. How do you refer your work? And I, I do believe that uh, this idea of this question of how does it refers to, does it helps you, was it first or whatever, I'm, I'm not so sure it's about this, this referring thing. I think we, we all are suffering from it by now. But I'm thankful to the work of Frank Lloyd Wright, especially this work of the spirit. I mean, um, why should I deny or why should I confirm? I think uh, what I know from this man's work at that time, I only could say I love it. Is it a straight reference? I think I never used this work explaining to my clients something we were heading for, saying like, let's have first a look to Frank, Lloyd, uh, to, um, Frank Gehry. So, I mean, this is, this is at a certain point, of course, I, I, I knew or I started to knew Frank Gehry at a certain moment as a student and a young architect. But I think the thing with reference is at this moment, which is much more interesting, is how, what is your distance to your reference? Not what is your closeness or your connection to your reference. So I could name other people from a Belgian field or French field or whatever who would I like to like to connect to it. So um, no, yes, uh, Frank Gehry at that time or in this very young work is, is very inspirational, but there you have another word which I believe is, is too much overquoted or too much quoted what is your inspiration? Yeah, in academic words, you have to say what is your reference, but it comes all to the same. And I do think that, um, to me at least, I hope that on one hand, and yes, you can name it, and on the other hand, you can feel also the distance to it. I do think that yes, his kind of closeness at a certain moment in his life towards the topic, the client and the commission, is com might be comparable to this closeness we love to work with or to look at in our work today. So uh, maybe I'll try to ask this without any uh, reference, but uh, maybe that some of these, these ideas would be implicit. I was struck when you talked about a, uh, the laziness of a way of yeah. working, because I think f for me uh, in my own practice, and I think as a kind of um, maybe an emerging or a present generational sensibility. Laziness is something uh, to be commended or uh, oh, yeah. I mean, uh, to aspire after, towards in the sense that uh, it suggests you might work much more directly with the things at hand instead of torturing yourself uh, oh, in the attempt to find something that's not there already. And so I wonder about the kind of ethic, okay. if we re recontextualize laziness or stripped it of some of its, uh, its ethical yeah. baggage and, okay. and rethought it. I, I shouldn't have quoted it maybe too much. Uh, the thing is, um, the only, we are not lazy at all, I think. Our work is very intensive, it's very demanding. Um, we are totally and constantly with it and in it, and there is no laziness around at all. The only thing that I wanted to say a little bit in a maybe overemphasized and a little bit too funny way is that reading contexts, understanding situations, embracing moments helps you to avoid at a certain moment the purely conceptual thinking. Conceptual thinking which then nowadays is always, let's say, uh, helped by the reference. You see the reference and a concept and then it's okay. No, uh, the, the expression of this laziness has merely or only to do with the fact that I believe that. The deeper you get into the things, the on one hand less you feel needed to do, but on the other hand still feel the freedom to do things which maybe are not really contextually connected, but you are allowed to do, since there is found that free space in that context you read so many times, so good, and 
in that sense, I feel lazy in the sense that I think we never have to impose too much architectural, conceptual thinking into things as we read the circumstances in time and so on. So I think, I, in a way, I mean, what I find interesting is the idea that if you look closely enough at something, uh, you derive from it both the materials themselves, which are maybe already present or at hand, and the rules for how to use them, which leads to a, a kind of, uh, not an inevitability, but a clarity in why things are the way they are. And that was, I think, very evident in, the, in some of the work you talked about and, and the way you talked about it. And then it, I think what's interesting about your work is that it's not merely that kind of strategic means of dealing with the situation at hand, but it also has a very uh, playful or unexpected quality. And this is maybe where the color comes in. So it's not all just that the materials are the the no. nature of the materials as they are. There's also a moment at which you choose to make it pink yeah. or salmon. And so how did those two aspects of the work, something which is contingent on what's already there and something which comes from the outside, how do those two inter deal with each How do you deal with those two forces in the work? You see many things together, but I try to sort out a little bit. Um, it, it, it is, it is, it is, to me, uh, it, there is of many people say to us like we don't understand that each time in every other project it can be so different. Uh, I think it is it is for many reasons that then, first of all we believe that each project is different and you have to start and to want to find out where it's really is about as much as possi possible. On the other hand, you, you find out through our time, our practices in this constitution now 10 years only, that thanks to having so many different ways of operating from housing to really large scale buildings, to exhibiting, to making books, to, to, to teach, is that it, it, it gives you the opportunity to change each time, to make it each time differently and that in one project you are really conscious about bringing the things in the right way together, again, reading the context and then in a playful way at the end, just shifting the things around to get on it. But then to be in another context, like in Charleroi, in which you experience, or this pavilion in which you experience almost the opposite interest of being busy with the ultimate detail the ultimate material composition or construction or whatever. And in those projects you discover things like saying, you know, at the end, the architectural detail, as we all are longing for, doesn't play a role anymore. Because the contractor has rules and they can do and so on. And you discover by doing it, like in a pavilion also, yeah, the whole thing, as maybe it's because I'm now in Switzerland, of being very precise with all the details, turns over into something, an experiment, a tryout, and you find out that next to the fact that the other day you're in another building with that detail really working, this is something else. I, th this difference sis, in, in all the projects we do has to do, I think, with this wide, first of all, wide differences in jobs we get, and on the other hand, um, the very energy demanding uh, optimism that for each project we take it as it comes and we don't want to take it as being part of a lined out idea where we think architecture is about. I think that's the title also about this, about that and so on and maybe it's true, I have to admit at the end everything comes together and there are things that come together but on the other hand I think that they also, it's, pro, it's a sprawl of things. Yeah. <laughs> Are there questions from the audience? I have more, but maybe. I think there's a microphone coming. Thank you. Uh, about your photographs of your project, um, I think uh, they are very carefully um, constructed or I would say that um, the aesthetics of it is very um, necessarily counterintuitive to 
the found quality that you're looking in a space. Uh, and it reminds me of Gordon Meta Clark perspective that are so carefully crafted to describe an argument, spatial argument. Um, then my question is how do you use photographs from the beginning of the project? Do you pho photograph them as a starting point or mm -hmm. you end with them? Mm, that's maybe something that I did not show today. But well, we have, uh, you know or understand, with Philippe Dujardin, quite a long understanding at this point. And more recently, last year, Philippe is also involved in documenting from the first moment the project. That's also something we work on to collect it. Um, on the other hand, to me, this photograph thing is very... Um, Philip, I think, is uh, the first observer of all what we do. And he photographs it. Uh, I never go with a photographer on site to line out how they should look or how, what they should picture. So all the photographs you see are independently taken by Philip Dujardin. And they bring our work in a certain perspective, light, viewpoint, of which I say, well, it's, it's what I was looking at or what I was wanting or what I was thinking, like I hope people will look at this in this way. And there are many other ways and the way photos and the way you, I've shown you. So secondly, this, this photograph thing becomes, of course, we have like 3,000 photographs of Philippe Dujardin actually on our work. And for example, the yellow stamp building I showed you is another project we started up with Philip. He is gonna photograph, we're gonna photograph those things together as a kind of documentary on things we've as found. So to me, the photos of Philip become not an important instrument to look ourselves back to our work and when we evolve in work to bring it on the table and to change things. There is, for example, another series we made with him in which he photographed in between building sites on which then we, with collages, paper collages, we changed this, the, the trace of how we wanted to make the interior, how it was foreseen. So those photographs become to me, yeah, they are, they are quite important to me. Uh, as you can understand, as I've shown them all, <laughs> or most of them, but they are, they are a comment to me on what they see, and I do believe that, that by his framing them all, and then that comes in publications or lectures like this, they, they really express on, from a distance where the work is about. On the other hand, I have to say and admit, and I didn't took time to include those, the archivist series is a new set of photographs a lot of black, black, white, light shadow, people around. Uh, Juan Rodriguez is a photographer who works a lot with Alvaro Sitza. And you see all of a sudden a totally other approach of, of captioning the work. And I have to say, I said it also to Philip, it's interesting to let now enter other photographers to view or to, to observe uh, the work. So yes, and then if you might know a little about Philippe Dujardin's work, uh, how it evolves nowadays, he also, let's say, performs as an artist more and more. And we cannot uh, deny the fact that there are things in between what he is doing in personal, in personal interest and what we are doing in personal interest. I still think something else needs to come up in between us, but yes, it's, it's, it's quite important. I don't know if this is an answer to your question somehow. Okay. Could I ask a, a slight follow-up, which is, I, know, I mean, earlier today, for instance, we were walking up the stairs and you took a photograph of the pylon holding open the door, and I noticed at the end of the, the lecture you show a number of photographs, and to me, I, I, your, the compositional sensibility of the work seems informed by photography in the sense that Photography also, uh, in a way, automatically captures a contingent set of relationships that one finds in the world. 
you don't go in and necessarily construct these things mm -hmm. precisely as a composition in their own right. You find, in a way, the composition already there. And it seems like somehow the this archive, not Philip's work, but your own archive of photographs, which I imagine there must be many of, uh, of things like the pylon holding the door open, must in some way, or like the, the intersection mm -hmm. at the Swiss and mm -hmm. uh, Italian border of the strange collection of objects that exist there, must somehow inform also the sensibility about how to put things together in a project. Mm. Maybe I, I would like to widen it there a little bit more open to um, the idea of art and architecture as such, in the sense that um, when I was raised as an architect, this happened in a school, which was a school for art and architecture. I was, I think, one of the last generations who had that opportunity. Later on, the school was sold out to the Bologna European standards of universities and faculties of architecture. Uh, but at, I had to admit that, that when I studied, this was quite an experience, going out to a school to, le to, 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 to learn the job of the architect, a constructor, and to find a school in which studios of painting and studios of sculpture and studios of architecture were next to each other. So if you missed the door, you were in another world. And then maybe the context of the Belgian scene in this, architect, in this art, I believe, is also to me, well, I have to admit, it's my context. I think if I start to think about, uh, I, I will say it now myself, but, but I try to avoid it, but to think about Marguerite, René Marguerite, which has been brought many times around our work and thinking. Uh, but also Broodhaard's uh, thinking about it. But then name you want, will not know, René Hevaert, which is this kind of fundamentalist, mi minimalist, picking up things out of context. Architect raised, becoming an artist. Or I would say uh, Francis Alice, who, who is maybe much more in this political way of working. I think this is, if, I can, if, if it helps to explain, it's not only about, uh, about photography of those things, but it's also about this surrounding of things in which I think I see, when I look to the Belgian art scene, the sensitivity to that is quite important, is quite prominent to say. So um, I do think that's why this, the work we make is often relate back to this idea of this kind of objet trouvé, dailiness, this kind of idea uh, in art that comes back. So I, I, I bring it now back to art and I don't want to bring it with the word reference because reference is often this kind of words that say, oh, it's a reference, so, oh, it's good. No, uh, uh, that's the academical smallness of thinking, I have to say. But I mean, the reference is, it's the, the art is not the reference, the art is a kind of condition, is a kind of context which we cannot deny, or I cannot deny when I make my work. But it's not art, it's architecture. And it's related to dailiness. And the photograph or the painting can, or the work of an artist can capture that. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. We got a microphone oh, here. Okay. Jan. Ah. <laughs> um, <laughs> we worked together five, uh, five, six years ago, <laughs> and as people may realize at this point, you're quite a special man. Um, I'm getting really ready for dinner, um, but we'll, we're, <laughs> we'll keep going and going and going. Um, and this was how meetings were with you. I think it's actually quite nice to realize that you're, you are a special man and it's nice, nice to be around you, but you come also from a fairly special place. Um, and to borrow from your last answer, you're from, uh, from Belgium, from, uh, uh, from the Flemish part of Belgium, which is an incredibly poetic place, probably more poetic than mo most places in Europe. And I've been wondering all those years, like what would your work be like if you were asked to do 
um, a house in Holland, where I'm from, or a project in the south of France, or in all these other places. Can your, uh, your language translate to those places, and how would you try to understand the context? And I should admit, we also worked on a project that was supposed to travel from country, country to country together. <laughs> I cannot talk about that no. project, you know? <laughs> I've signed here, maybe. <laughs> if I talk about now, then I might be jailed this night. <laughs> um, well, actually, uh, and <laughs> which is a funny story, um, I found out that we built a building or a set of houses in Holland. We designed them for the city in Amersfoort, for the developers, and we passed a very fast development commission, and then we heard nothing about it, and I discovered half a year ago that they were, in the meantime, built. <laughs> That's how it goes when you do it in Holland. Uh, and um, the funny thing is that they look very Flemish on the outside, and they look very Hollandish on the inside, and I don't mean then the traditional Hollandish way, but the... Uh, way how now uh, um, houses are built in Holland. Well, the side story. Your question is what it would be when we work um, abroad. So yes, in Holland we, we did really of the we built really in the city center of Amersfoort, and we did really a big survey on understanding the historical building idea, and by that we could really the Wellstone sit at that time. The commission was 12 apartments. They expected the building with apartments, and they got 12 houses. Even the, even the, 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 the investor was surprised on it, and we kept it passed just because it was better. And this was the whole thing, so I still don't understand what happened afterwards. In Italy, we worked also. So perhaps let's refine it a little bit. Can you work without a poetic, poetic client? Can I frame back this yeah. um, uh, Francis Alice thing? I loved very much this political and this poetic, the two words coming together, even phonetically, how we place them together. I don't think at any time our goal is in what we make to be poetic. And I don't think at any time in what we make we want to be political. But I do think that in the work we make, the economy, I can, I don't know if the, you find this of, of main importance, but we keep every budget. We keep every budget. We never make any mistake in budget. You could say, is that important for architecture? I know for most of the world star architects, this is of non-importance. But I don't believe this ar architecture is about that. I don't believe architecture is about being poetic. What I do believe is that it's nice that later on you can live and work in it and discover a moment of poetry in it. So all those things are to me or to us not goals or briefs we give ourselves when we make things. But I'm sometimes myself surprised how easily you can bring them to the fore, to the foreground, where, where everyone believes, like, I know this poetry, and, 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 and. but I think, yeah, as long as it's never a goal, and as long as you keep your eyes wide shut, you never will find them. And, and, and then this is, to me, an appreciation, not a goal and not a mission. And um, I don't think a poet writes to become poetic. He writes to write, he writes to write a poem. And then later on we see whether, he sees whether people found it poetic or not. I guess, I hope. Others it's a misunderstanding of my sight. But no, I think to me what you see is economic economy my my opinion if we if this this caritas building 100,000 more than demolishing it's about economy the same with the large thing we are doing right now it's about economy it's about rediffusing 
money over a building project. But then at the end, probably at the end of the opening, I'm pretty sure people will say, what a poetic park that we got. I hear it saying now already. <laughs> but I'm sometimes really annoyed with that thing. But I don't mind you ask or you say, and I, I'm also glad it is there, but, but it's not the drive to do things. At the end, people should be able to sleep in bedrooms. I think that might set up the last question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so thank you. It was, it was uh, it's a nice lecture. Um, so I've followed your work for a while. And even though uh, you don't like to think of references, I sort of understand the um, impact your office has ha is having on a lot of European offices, I think. Um, which is to say that you guys are being used as a reference quite often. And it's less of a question, I guess, than like a concern, which I'm curious about, your reaction, which is uh, your work is very careful, um, but maybe can, has the potential to be lazy. And um, so it's like on a knife edge. And I think while when you guys do it, it's very nice and very appropriate and maybe moral, let's say, I have this concern that there's all these people copying you, doing it very poorly. And in that case, it's actually a, it could be a, real, a big problem. It could be unsafe, could be you know, a lot of things, um, or just uncomfortable, or maybe not beautiful. And I was just curious, knowing the impact you're having on a lot of architecture students and offices, um, what, what, what you think, or if there's a solution or some thought. Well, solution. <laughs> um, yeah, what, what can I say about it? I, I think it's, it's a very difficult question, honestly, because um, it's sensitive towards people. I mean, yes, I sometimes and very often I would like to talk with people on this, of which and... Yeah, you see those things. You exactly frame the risks, I have to say. I don't have a solution to that. Um, but I would love to talk more about it often with people. It is... It is um, well, yeah, what, what do you want, eh? On one hand, you want... Well, no, it's not that I want to make work that could be a reference to one, someone else. On the other hand, you want to make good work, so inevitable, it becomes part of a debate. And maybe before it becomes part of a debate, it becomes part of, I see it, I admit, but I don't feel guilty for it, but it becomes part of a culture, one could say. To, to. Okay, and I think it's, it's okay, I think, on one hand, that, that, that we can help to change minds on it. But of course, everyone should for himself or herself keep in mind that what we exactly do is try to create freedoms to then do some things which at the end people might call poetic. And I do think then that I miss sometimes in other work the f that freedom taking that freedom to then there design and draw it just where again a little bit different but it's it is it is a thing which i'm not ready with and i i'm quite concerned about also but which is a very difficult topic because i believe um, it, it doesn't deliver wrong things not at all but i'm sometimes hungry on that kind of small challenge that comes back, that could come back. And um, talking about laziness, well, I'm, I'm, I, I use it often to say it, but I do think it's not about laziness. So um, in that sense, it's true. It's, uh, Philippe Dujardin, as a practical joke, sometimes sent me photographs to congratulate me with a new project that I haven't made, and of course, which is not at all 
having it all. On the other hand, I delivered to some of the very nice things of which I don't know what to say, but I got uh, overwhelmed by reactions of congratulations that I won a competition in, Aust in Australia over summer, a quite big thing. And um, when I found out it was a competition in which our name was prominently uh, there, and then two other names, and one name was of a guy I said, oh yes, true, I know this name, I know this guy. It was clear to me that it was probably not a practical joke, because it was announced on Divisare, so it was official. But it wasn't true, an experiment of a studio in Australia, guided by that man, who somehow, I still don't understand exactly how it happened, but somehow they entered an, an official competition or something, and he asked to his students to act like a practice. So this student group, together with our name, entered the competition and won it. It's good as summer when you receive that message. But it's, it's I, I, I don't know, I, don't, I really don't know exactly how I should answer your question, honestly. But I, I really understand your concern. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Those two last questions were... <laughs> <I agree. laughs>